of the Peculiar. He's a frequent contributor to the Fortean Times and he specialises in cultural Fortiana. So for the past, past couple of years he's been the magazine's resident couch potato, aka TV reviewer. He's an active member of the paranormal research community and since 2002 he's been first a moderator of and now administrator of the Fortean Forums, which until the end of 2018 was the Fortean Times message board. And that was the largest and longest lived of the online discussion forums. So this has given him a unique vantage point to observe trends and attitudes in Fortean thought and the paranormal in general over the last 20 years. And I've added this last bit in because I think you're a bit too modest here. So Stu, delightfully, is also a member of the ASAP Executive Committee and he acts as our webmaster. Um, what else can I add about you? No, I better not. I dread actually. to think. You never. <laughs> 56 years of passing. Over to you, Stu. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen. Dun, 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 dun. Here we go. Then. Right. I remember the very first time I ever saw Bigfoot. It was on the 6th of July, 1975. In that week's Radio Times, the world about us, monsters, mysteries or myths, had been ringed about 40 times in red crayon. And I waited for what seemed like a century until I found myself about three feet from the screen binoculars around my neck and in my kung fu pyjamas, not wanting to miss a thing. I'd never heard of Bigfoot before that. No, by the way, kung fu pyjamas and binoculars, I was eight at the time, so forgive me, okay? I don't tend to wear them so much these days. Um, I'd never heard of Bigfoot before that. I had no idea about him. I'd heard of the Yeti and I'd heard of Nessie, but no idea about Bigfoot. And the first two thirds of the programme were about Nessie and the Yeti. And then it went to a different montage. And it was a footage of foresty vistas and people in Stetsons and uh, folksy looking log built general stores with a backdrop of redwoods and mountains. And there was a gentle camera glide along a woodland path. And then suddenly abruptly silent and shaking uh, as if running. And there it was. It had been filmed by... Roger Patterson on the right in the Natty Cardigan and on the left, Bob Gimlin on the 20th of October 1967 in Bluff Creek, Northern California. The two had been engaged in a Bigfoot hunt with a view to filming one to incorporate in a documentary that Patterson wanted to produce about the legend. They ran to the corner and encountered what, in their words, was an adult female Sasquatch, approximately seven feet in height. The horses shied. Patterson jumped down, grabbed the film camera from a saddlebag and ran towards the figure, filming as he ran, which is why it's very, very jerky to start with. And this is the original result. Now, we're used to seeing very cleaned up versions these days, but this is the original result. OK, so uh, don't expect too much. There you go. He's off there. He's jumped off the horse. He's now running towards it. OK, he stopped, rests the camera onto a log. Just enough to steady it enough to see that. And it walks on. Now, this is the bit that we're all used to seeing. But in fact, this is only half of the shot of the footage. It carries on, as you can see. He then ran after it a little bit more. OK. And he manages to focus on it. And you can just about see it in a second. You'll just see the figure disappearing. There you go, into the tree line. Don't forget, these are Californian redwoods. These are these are 300 foot trees. They're huge and massive. So it's a tiny little dot disappearing off. Anyway. It was then shown again in slow-mo and then frozen, as it always is, at the famous turn. Uh, frame number 354, which is the one we're all used to. Uh, and it just left that one single iconic image remaining. And as an eight-year-old in Kung Fu pyjamas, that absolutely fascinated me. And at the same time, kind of terrified me in a funny way. It just really scared me. 
I had no way of reviewing the moving footage. Bear in mind, this was the 70s. VCRs were still years away. And British television consisted of three television channels, all of which competed with one another to see how quickly they could close down at the end of the evening. So for a long time, you just had to be content with stills. And normally the stills were in books and they were almost invariably 354, that frame there. Um, and there was often compendium books as well, which would devote anything up to three or four pages to Bigfoot. And a sentence or two of that would be about Patty. Very little knowledge of it over this side of the Atlantic. And in fact, not that much on the other side either. Well, I finally then got to see it properly, as it were. Um, by then, I knew it was her in colour in September 1980. Uh, and it was part of Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World, part four, The Missing Eight Men. Uh, it's the first time many people in the UK actually saw it. Um, and of course, afterwards, the great sage of Taunton, as he tended to do, declared himself unconvinced by the footage. Uh, but I was completely wrapped by it. Uh, by then, I'd amassed a number of books about Bigfoot in particular, most of which actually devoted a fair bit of discussion to the Patterson film, because it is still Exhibit A in many respects. Was it real? Was it a suit? Did Patterson fake it? Did Gimlin help Patterson fake it? Were they both fate themselves? Were they both pranked? All of these questions do seem relatively easy to answer, but in fact, they don't, because as soon as you go a little bit deeper into it, it becomes an awful lot more complicated. What I'm going to try and do is keep this relatively focused, because it's very easy to go off fractal with this. OK, so. um, The film sequence, this is what I'm going to do, the film sequence itself that we've just watched, is the only actual primary source. That's all there is relating to the whole incident. Everything else is secondary, or the or the anecdotal evidence, um, the alleged footprint casts, uh, the massive inconsistencies of accounts of what happened afterwards, claims and counterclaims and stuff. They are all secondary. The only primary piece is this footage. So this is what I'm going to focus on, because otherwise uh, we would be here all night and you'd be sick to death of me within hours quite easily. The first most basic question after seeing it is, of course, if the footage shows a real creature or a human being in a suit. And by this, I mean, it's a real thing on the film. It's not an animation. It's not a puppet. It's not some sort of superimposition. Um, the issue of whether it's a genuine Sasquatch or a costumed actor is a separate discussion. But it is one that we will address because it's obviously really important to the, to the, to the debate. So one of the first issues that we need to talk about concerns the speed at which the film should be actually viewed because it has a huge impact on what you look at. Um, there comes a bit of a sciencey bit. I will warn you now. It's important, though. I'll try and keep it um, to, to like as quick as I can, so please bear with. The camera that Patterson was using was one of these. It was a Kodak 16mm. Um, they could operate at several speeds. Now, the slowest practical speed for these cameras is 16 frames per second. Right. Well, and that's the most economical one, because the same quantity of film could glean a huge number of extra minutes of footage. But at the expense of quality, it's really low quality, very low definition, very grainy. The highest regular speed, 24 frames per second, uses the film stock up a whole 50 percent faster. But the definition is much, much higher. And it's also the most compatible speed with analog television. Now, Patterson stated that he didn't know at which speed he had filmed the figure. As on the side there, you can see there's a dial with several speeds and literally he hadn't looked and you could knock it with your thumb and it'd be a completely different speed. Um, he just basically picked up the camera out of the saddlebag, run it and started shooting. Why it's important is because the speed at which it's viewed drastically alters the figure's gait. It was analysed by Dr Don Grieve, who's a reader in biomechanics at London Free Hospital, or was rather, he's, he's been dead a while now. Grieve pointed out that the gait at 16 frames per second or 18 frames per second would be extremely inefficient. The metabolic cost would be unnecessarily high as it would overuse the musculature and joints and use far more calories than it needed to. Animals naturally will move in the most economical manner as possible to conserve energy. And the, also the creature in the, in the film swings its arms too much at those speeds. Its stride is too exaggerated and it represents... Uh, doesn't represent any efficient use of physical resources. Grieve says the film, if it was shot at 24, then the gate is basically indistinguishable from a human being walking in an exaggerated manner. He also managed to estimate that the height 
was around 196 centimeters, uh, which is around six foot four, six foot five. Um, estimated weight of about 120 kilos, um, which would it render at most a 30 centimeter or one foot footprint, which is at variance with Patterson's estimate of a seven foot creature, which was very heavily built. And other discrepancies then started to become apparent. Now then, Dr. John Napier, anatomist of Birkbeck College, London, now, is this not the most British photograph you have ever seen in your life, right? This is Paul Temple here, right? All he needs is a Bakelite phone alongside him. Ring, ring. What's that? Yeah, a Yeti on Kilburn High Road to the Lagonda Steve. Put it down. That didn't it? That's the most British phone. Anyway, right. John Napier states that the, 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 foot, the footprints that Patterson cast after the sighting were closer to 15 inches long which would indicate a creature at least seven foot eight inches in height with an indicative stride of 53 inches. However, the distance between the footprints is only 41 inches, which is more along the lines of a six foot humanoid. So a footprints that Patterson presented belong to a taller being. And whatever their provenance, Napier concluded that the two items, film and footprints, do not belong together. They're not from the same thing. However, despite all this, Napier stopped short of actually declaring it is an outright fake. And bear in mind, this is the man who was the world expert on the anatomy of feet. He'd been an orthopedic surgeon for any number of years and had retired to become professor of anatomy at Birkbeck. Um, as I said, he doesn't declare it as a fake. In fact, he was the very first one to coin the phrase, I can't see the zip. It was only the footprint evidence which he actually discounted but again he doesn't say they're fake footprints he just said it doesn't belong to whatever's on the film furthermore napier declared that on balance he did actually believe in the objective reality of bigfoot and almost definitely the yeti um he just didn't necessarily buy that patty was one of course for every expert there is an equal and opposite expert so grover Krantz who said first one, by the way, who really set the trend for holding up a cast of a big footprint in photographs. And um, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, also holding up a cast of a big footprint in photographs. Um, both strong academic proponents of the flesh and blood Bigfoot hypothesis. And each found the film convincing, despite, in Krantz's case, initially dismissing it. Krantz disagreed with most of Napier and Greaves' objections, finding that, in his opinion, the centre of gravity and gait were actually not human-like at all. Um, both he and Meldrum felt that the walking motion itself was both entirely naturalistic-looking and would be, for a human, actually very difficult to replicate. This was further echoed by Russian researcher Dmitry Bayanov, here seen holding a Bigfoot footprint cast, who, along with the Canadian-Swiss René de Hinden, holding two footprint casts here, you notice, um, which makes up for their colleague Igor Burtsev, who decided to let the side down by not holding up any footprint casts. Um, and they, they conducted an in-depth study of the footage, along with Nikita Levinsky, who was a Russian sculptor who specialised in anatomy and in costume for the, uh, for the Kirov Ballet. Um, Levinsky argued that an extremely detailed costume would actually do more to betray a hoaxer than it would to augment it in any way, because it would hinder the movement the actor within could actually take. Shoulder pads, so American football style, would have an indentation on the shoulder, and you can't get around that, apparently. That would be nearly impossible. Um, and interestingly, though, they don't give any attention at all to the footprint evidence. They kind of, there's maybe a tacit agreement with Napier that there's no continuity of evidence there anyway. Um, and according to their own account, in fact, Patterson and Gimlin didn't cast the prints until a couple of hours later. They'd left their plaster back at the campsite a number of miles away, which does seem to show a bit of lack of preparedness. And there's a few little niggles like this in the story. However, back to this. Most of these analyses were completed in the 70s and 80s. But what the researchers lacked then was what we today have in abundance, which was, of course, computers and imaging software. Uh, they could only have dreamt of that and also the internet. So whereas I had to wait, in my case, nearly 15 years to see basically Bigfoot and have some way of watching it myself repeatedly, um, basically now you can search on Patterson Bigfoot and YouTube and you'll find hundreds of copies of it, each of them with its own take on the action. And some have forensically examined every single frame, 
close up, especially 354, and observed a host of details, um, some of which the viewer may even be able to see too if you squint enough and you know, address the contrast and there's enough wishful thinking on your part, to be honest, in some cases. But in some, yeah, you know, that's the problem. When you start uh, start augmenting stuff with AI, then it can start making its own decisions. Caveat emptor. Anyway. Apart from the Zapruder film of Kennedy's death, it's the single most analysed moving image in the history of Fortiana without any doubt whatsoever. Nothing has been looked at more or analysed more. There are plenty who still continue to pronounce it fake, uh, but there's an equal number challenging them to point out the zipper. So, could it be a suit? Well, Patterson, seen here holding two Bigfoot footprint cuffs, was well aware of the two most detailed descriptions of the creatures that previously existed before Patterson Gimbin film was filmed. Those were those of William Rowe and Albert Osman. Rowe observed one in British Columbia in the 1950s, up close. Um, he was a, a hunter, he looked at it through his sights and he saw what appeared to be a small Bigfoot, basically eating fruit um, at a distance, unaware of his presence. And he watched it for some considerable time. He also felt, as many do, that he couldn't actually shoot it. It looked too human. Ostman, on the other hand, as many people will be aware, had claimed to be kidnapped whilst prospecting by a family of Bigfoots and held hostage by them for a number of days in a cave. Um, he, he described an entire family, a, a father, a mother, uh, what looked like an older teenage girl and a teenage boy. Anyway, so Rowan Ostman, both have been published, as I said, not long before Patterson. Um, there were some differences, however, in their descriptions mostly in the width of the hips. Ostman stated that both the mother and daughter had very wide hips, whereas Rose said they weren't in comparison with the rest of the body. They had breasts, so they're obviously female, but it was more straight up and down. Um, Rose's own drawing, which looks like that, does look quite a bit like Patterson's Bigfoot. If you look, you know, it's got the boobs, it's got the, it's, yeah, you know. But then a lot of people believe, Napier suggests, on the basis of that, that perhaps this was a juvenile female. Now, this is a very important for reasons that have only recently come to light, which I shall now explain. In 2022, after a great deal of persistent searching, the actual site of the footage was actually found. It's very important to remember that Bluff Creek is serious Northern Californian backcountry. And even today, as CJ mentioned earlier on, it's miles from the nearest proper road literally 30 miles from the nearest logging road. It's rough terrain. And Bluff Creek itself is not some little like 200 yard runway. It's four or five miles of winding riverbed, basically. It's a dynamic living landscape as well because it does flood and then that will bring down rocks. It will alter the banks. It will do all of that stuff. Trees will grow, trees will fall. You know, basically over the space of 50 years, it's a completely different landscape from what it was when it was filmed. However, there are certain landmarks which don't change. And in the case of the footage, there are three dead trees in a row, which are identifiable in the enhanced versions of the film. And they're still there, 50 years on, 56 years on, they're still there. So using LIDAR, which is the, li the laser mapping system that can render a millimeter accurate 3D map of any given area, researcher Bill Munns has rendered the footage seen as a virtual arena. So he's basically recreated what you can see there, superimposed on what it now looks like. But with those three trees as the reference points, he can measure everything to within millimetres as to where it is relative to each other. Now, this has allowed him to accurately measure the size of the figure. Patterson said it was seven foot. Don Greve said it was six foot five. Napier said it was about six foot five as well. It is actually six feet three inches tall precisely. Yes, it's exactly the same height as me, but I gave you my alibi at the beginning. I was eight years old at the time and in Bristol. So there you go. Don't blame me. Now, on the back of this, there's become a somewhat odd argument that being for a Sasquatch, six foot three is quite diminutive. And therefore, the figure must be fake because Sasquatches are seven foot tall. The problem is this completely ignores the fact that all seven to nine foot tall creatures will, at some point in their lives, have been six foot three because... That's how growth works. You don't start that height, you become that height. And at one point, you will have been my height. It wasn't me, honestly. 
So, as been pointed out, if it was an adolescent, as Rose was suspected to have been, it may have also been less aware and less wary of humans, which is why it was caught out in this way. There does seem to be some other anecdotal evidence which suggests young big feet are more curious and they're less wary. The older ones are an awful lot more guile about them. Coming back to a costume, the possibilities and practicalities of such a costume even existing in the mid 60s have been discussed for years. John Chambers, who made the Planet of the Apes, has been mooted as the pay too much the only person with the technical ability at the time, although he himself has always strenuously denied that he had anything to do with it. And in fact, he went as far as to say that if it was a suit, it was so technically accomplished, he himself doubted he could have done it. Um, it would have had to be completely tailor made. And both he and Rick Baker, who basically did an American Werewolf in London, have a load of other observations along these lines. I mean, most notably in the Planet of the Apes series, there were grades of makeup and costume. So the principal characters, because they're in close up a lot of the time, famously had to spend hours in the chair as they often appeared in close up. And the prostheses were painstakingly attached to the facial muscles to allow the movement and to allow the expression, which is incredibly delicate work, frequently falls apart, frequently needs to be retouched or patched throughout the day. And another important point being that the snout, for want of a better word, actually meant their vision was impeded. If you do it yourself with your hands over your nose like that, you can't see your feet. And as a result, they were prone to trip and slip all the time and had to have a smooth and completely level path in front of them if they were going to be walking anywhere towards camera, because otherwise they would just literally trip over the first thing they could trip over. Um, Bluff Creek itself is, of course, anything but smooth and level. It's full of rocks, tree roots, you name it. This is an important thing to remember. Back to Planet of the Apes. Also, there was grades, as I said, of makeup. So the ones who were going to be close up, the principal characters, had the very intricate stuff. Characters in the middle of distance or long range shots needed a lot less intricate makeup. And for those only seen in long shot, if you look at the guys at the back there on the horses, they're basically wearing rubber masks effective the sort of thing you pick up in a good quality joke shop just augmented slightly uh, because the camera couldn't pick up that degree of detail so it didn't matter in a long shot fine stick a rubber mask on them also in planet of the apes the actors were all clothed so you didn't need to cover the body in hair or anything like that only the exposed bits of flesh so if patty was a suit chambers and baker have both said it would have to be one designed for medium to long range as close-ups would have with the tech of the time completely betrayed it. You couldn't have got a close up if it was a suit. It would show. Um, but even so, even at a distance, it would have cost an awful lot of money. Studio level money. Basically, the sort of thing Warner Brothers could afford. Not many other people can. To be to convincing even at that kind of distance. And there's another factor. Of course, now we can zoom in. We can clean up the image. All of which is technology that Patterson never even dreamed of. So now when we watch the Patterson footage, rather than that jerky, really, really blurry image, we can see something like this. Which is, of course, what we're all used to seeing these days. There have been other people who claim that they, in fact, did make the suit. Most famously, Philip Morris, who was a North Carolina costumier who claimed to have sold Patterson the suit in 1967 and suggested that the actor inside wear American football shoulder pads. He couldn't, however, provide any evidence whatsoever to substantiate this claim. And in fact, National Geographic offered him $250,000 to recreate the suit. And he just declined. He just said he basically, for whatever reason, he couldn't do it. So basically, Philip's story is... Mm, not regarded by very many as at all credible. Other attempts have been made. The BBC have tried it. Now, I have to say, I do quite like Chris Packham. I do like him. I, I, I appreciate his stand on nature and things like that. He's combative, but, you know, he has his opinions and he stands by his principles. Um, however, he doesn't believe in Bigfoot. But he did try to recreate the Patterson film in 1998 in his series X Creatures. And... Well, basically, it didn't look so much like Patterson, the suit that they came out with. The suit they came out with was that. Yeah, just take that in for a minute. Um, not really convincing. It looks less like Patterson, rather more like that, if you ask me. 
Um, and the walk was even less convincing, to be honest. But nonetheless, Packham pronounced that the original must therefore also be fake because he was pretty convinced that they'd managed to recreate it. Um, but then again, as I said, he started off stating he doesn't believe in Bigfoot anyway, so why would he do otherwise, you know? Hey ho. What is for sure is that if it is a suit, it's an incredibly sophisticated one for the time, which had to account for ease of movement as much as convincing appearance. And as per the opinion of Nikita Levinsky, the sculptor and the, the costume designer I mentioned earlier, such a costume, and this is very important, would be almost impossible for anybody to put on single handedly. Now, that's a vital piece of information. Bear it in mind. We need to look at the other evidence surrounding the incident. Unfortunately, Roger Patterson himself, here seen holding a big foot footprint cast, um, had passed away in 1972. And until the end, he always declared that it was not a hoax. So despite having written a book about Bigfoot, he was trying to raise money to make a documentary about Bigfoot. And he had a loaded camera ready when they stumbled across a Bigfoot. It didn't deter him from pronouncing its authenticity. The only other identified participant, Bob Gimlin, here seen holding some Bigfoot footprint cast, completely refused to talk about it at all until a few years ago. And the truth be told, he hasn't said a whole lot since then. But what he has said and what he believes, and everybody who's met him says this is genuine, he doesn't think he did not participate in a hoax. Now this... And we're going to get all Fortean and philosophical here and a bit Occam's razor. It opens up four possibilities and just four regarding the Patterson film. OK, number one, it was a hoax and both Patterson and Gimlin were complicit. Therefore, Gimlin is lying. Two, it was a hoax which Patterson arranged and Gimlin was duped. Three, it was a hoax and both Patterson and Gimlin were duped. Or, number four, it wasn't a hoax at all. That's the only four possibilities. So, let's take them one by one. Was Gimlin complicit? Well, if he was, then it's perfectly possible that there were multiple takes on the day of a man in a suit with all day to get it right. The only possible risk being someone else catching them doing it or indeed a real short-sighted Randy male Bigfoot coming out of the woods and chasing them around, which, to be honest, if you put that to Yakety Sacks, would be the best footage in the world. But let's come back. There could have been any number of other people there if it was a set-up shoot with them both complicit. And besides, even besides the three of them, Patterson, Gimlin, whoever was in the costume, and there are those who claimed it was them, most notably, of course, Bob Hieronymus. But for everybody who knows about Bob Hieronymus, who went to his grave claiming he was Bigfoot, the man was six foot eight. And so according to Bill Munn's LIDAR, it can be Bob Hieronymus because he's too tall, which is a wonderful thing and splendidly ironic. Anyway, moving on. Option two, if Gimlin wasn't complicit, it would involve a lot of setup on Patterson's part. He'd have had to stage manage it amazingly because there couldn't have been anybody else around. What it would have involved would be an actor in a presumably very hot, uncomfortable suit, sitting around potentially for hours in the October heat of Northern California, the humidity, the insects, okay? Basically sitting around without any form of assistance and in a suit at least good enough to fool an experienced hunter, i.e. Bob Gimlin, so probably intricate to get into and nigh impossible to get into alone. That is a tough ask for anybody. And besides which, have you ever met actors? Good God, they're demanding people. Anyway, it's not impossible, but it's a one-take deal because if they fluffed it, what are you going to do? Patterson's insistence if they encounter one, they must not shoot it, has by some been cited as evidence they didn't want Gimlin accidentally and unknowingly injuring an actor. But um, that's very apocryphal as well. A lot of this stuff came out later. Or maybe neither were complicit and both were pranked by a third party. But see the one above for all of that. The logistical likelihood of that with the added lack of guarantee that they didn't go anywhere near them. As I said, it's such a huge area, 30 miles from the nearest road. If you just go literally one degree further in that direction, you're going to miss whoever that is by miles. So highly unlikely that it was a prank against them both. 
Um, you can also take John Green's observation about huge lines of footprints in the snow. The whole point about a hoax is it relies on somebody seeing it. If nobody sees it, it's an absolutely pointless thing, you know. So it's very time critical. Uh, they are. Yeah. Anyway. So the, the final possibility. Is that it shows a female Bigfoot walking away from the camera. That's the only other four. But that's the only four possibilities. There are, it has to be said, issues with the backstory. Um, the timings for a start. The, peer, the period from film capture to first screening was an impressive 48 hours. And bear in mind, they were miles from anywhere when they shot it. It was shown in local theatres in Washington State two days after it was shot. On the Sunday, it was shot on the Friday. And uh, on the Sunday, it was actually shown in, in the cinema in Washington State. Basically, it was filmed at about 1.30 in the afternoon on the Friday. The pair claimed to have then tracked Patty on horseback for about a mile or two. And then back to the campsite to get plaster, back to the sighting site, cast the prints, which takes a time in itself. It doesn't go off immediately. You're looking probably a good hour for that. Back to the campsite again, and then still managed to get 50 miles south by 6.30 to ship the film for processing. Whoops, went too far. Uh, sorry, um, to, for processing. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, this would have been a very busy five hours. In addition, it was a Friday evening, and this is really important as they were using Kodachrome 2 film, which could only be processed at certain laboratories. Now, Patterson stated he'd shipped the film to his brother-in-law in Yakima, Washington, uh, which is a distance of 600 miles. And the only way he could have done that was by plane. The nearest lab then to Yakima was Seattle, which is another 150 miles. So a 750 mile trip for this film. And the lab in Seattle Shut down on Friday evenings. It didn't work at weekends. In fact, the only lab that would have been able to turn it around and work to the weekend was Kodak's main one in Palo Alto, which is twice as close to Bluff Creek and in completely the opposite direction. But no lab has ever come forward and admitted that they processed the film. Patterson's brother-in-law, Al D. Aitley, has just remained very, very vague about details and until he passed away, he just remained quite tight-lipped. It has been pointed out that, in fact, if the footage had been shot days or even weeks earlier, then none of these time issues are a problem. It's completely redundant. So it does beg a belief slightly why they would obfuscate when it just opens up more yawning gaps in the story. We'll never know unless Gimlin decides to say. But, you know, a lot of people think Gimlin is completely on board with it being real. What is indisputable is that the image had by then embedded itself into mainstream culture. Bigfoot stopped being a local legend. Bigfoot had gone global. Now, the most obvious evidence for this came about when Bigfoot made a cameo appearance in The Six Million Dollar Man, looking very like the Patterson figure. And that's Andre the Giant, by the way, contact lenses him. Patty, three, 354 especially, has become her own archetype. The outline adorns T-shirts, necklaces, onesies. The silhouette is just so immediately recognisable. It's the emblem of many Bigfoot research organisations. And indeed, it's become kind of the emblem of cryptozoology as a whole. For all the miles of blurry footage that's followed, Patty is still the recognisable one. It's as iconic as Marilyn Monroe's skirt being blown up by the grating. It's as it's all King Kong swatting at biplanes. It's become its own archetype. <coughs> I suppose all of this really does demand some sort of conclusion. In all honesty, despite having myself seen it probably at least a thousand times now, I really don't know what the Patterson film is portraying. It could be an extremely, extremely clever fate. However, I'm quite willing to accept that Patterson, who was a chance of par excellence, just lucked out and managed to capture a live one on film and simultaneously to produce perfect alleged cryptic footage in its detailed enough to lend at least a little bit of credence and scrutiny, but not sufficiently clear, sharp and triangulated to provide solid evidence, which is, of course, the trend that we have with everything to this very day. That's never changed. The movie of itself, however, actually the footage is of great interest as an example of ambiguity. I think of it very like the Shroud of Turin, in that in many respects, the actual nature of the figure portrayed is only half the story. The medium in which it's pictured is just as important, if not more. 
And the fact that it still divides opinion and defies definitive debunking 50 years on, despite all the marches technology and analysis have ever made, basically is remarkable. Even if it is one day proven to be fake unequivocally, it will still be as faulty an artefact in itself as a Fiji mermaid. Personally, I tentatively believe in the objective reality of Bigfoot, at least in a global sense. One of them exists somewhere and they're, they're there somewhere. But I don't immediately believe that Patty is an actual example of one. I'd love it to be. I really, really would. But I'll be pleasantly surprised if after all these years it is proven to be so. But even if it isn't, it will still be fascinating in itself as an amateur film that can keep an entire tranche of people guessing for half a century. And that, my dear friends, is Fortianism at its very essence. So here's to Patty, maybe another 50 years where she can keep us all guessing. And I thank you very much for your kind attention, you lovely people. Thank you very much indeed. You can talk now. Thank you very much indeed. I will. Right. Okay. Let's uh, let's get back into. Oh, Alexa, put the light on. Okay, Alexa, put the light on. Okay. Right. Sorry about that. I was sitting in the dark so I could see better. Right. Thank you very much indeed. That was a truly fascinating presentation. Can you hear me? All right. Yes. Good. Right. OK, so we've got the evidence. We've got two pieces of evidence. Uh, we've got the casts from the feet. Do they still exist? They do. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're in. Um, I think they're in um, Lauren Commons Museum. And they're generally considered to be the gen to be, as far as we can tell, acceptable. So it's not one piece of 40 and ambiguity. It's two, two. The feet yeah. and the casts. There are subsequent casts. Do the subsequent casts of alleged Bigfoots match the anatomical and physiological um, characteristics of the Patty ones? No, they don't. That's the point. The Patterson one um, is a much smaller Bigfoot. So the feet would be around a foot long as opposed to 17 inches long, which is what some of the, the casts are. So the, the assumption that many people have made, including Lauren Coleman, I think John Green at the time, said was, well, it's for all we know, it's basically a Bigfoot highway. There could be 25 of them walking up and down there at any given time. Patterson just lucked out. He filmed one of them, saw the footprints, and assumed it was those for that one's footprints. You know? Right. I understand. So that was filmed. Right. Okay. Let's move over to the questions. Um, let me get across to the chat. Um, good evening, all. Hello. Welcome. I'm just going down until we get to Jackie Tonks says same area as me, Patty at 56, age men. Oh, I see. Um, Liz says she'll <laughs> wear the bet lynch earrings as long as she can call everyone cock. Um, she can clearly remember Coronation Street of that era. But the Patty site is now two and a half miles from a logging road, but very heavy going to get to. Jackie, you've been there, haven't you? Let's get yeah, Jackie talking. Um, my actual sighting of two Bigfoots running across a logging road was we we did a, a sort of aerial thing and found it was actually two and a half miles from the Patty site. So mm -hmm. possibly the ones I saw were related to Patty, which is quite a strange thought. Um, I I actually know Gimlin quite well because he's actually best mates with my main Bigfoot mentor. I spent okay. quite a lot of time with him, and he's a and Gold. Um, Tom Cantrell, who's, who's his very best mate, said basically you will meet him and you will know in 10 minutes that guy did not does not lie. And he's so transparent. He's yeah. Yeah. one of these completely transparent people. And he I sat down with him and I, you know, and he said, I could have been set up by Patterson. I highly don't think so, because it was quite cold at that time of year and we were following this thing for ages. And the, there was bears around, hungry bears, just about to hibernate. And anybody walking around in a suit in that area would have been a fool. You know, they, they and they would have been very cold at night if they hadn't set a fire. So, but, he, but he, you know, he never sort of elaborates and says, 
oh, I've seen loads of other scents. He said he was at campfire once and he saw a possible one in a silhouette. But if if he was somebody who confabulated, I think there'd be loads of other, you know, sightings and elaborate sightings and, oh, yes, this happened. But he, he just seems extremely honest. You know, he's, he's one of very, very nice chap. He's very devout Christian. He's one of these mm -hmm. real genuine Christians who, who really follows the Bible and, and he's very sort of helping everybody and very sweet. And I don't think lying would go with his religion, to be quite frank. It's not who he is at all. You know, he's yeah. um, a very nice guy. Yeah. Brilliant. Good to hear. No, that, that, that confirms what a lot of people have said about him, that he's completely straightforward. He's just like, there's no side to book him then. You know, he's yeah. a humble man, isn't he? He's very... Yeah, very much so, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So he's a very honest, very straightforward honest bloke as well. Could he yeah. be seen as naive, though? I mean, he, as he said, he could have been set up by Patterson. So he's admitting that, you know, I could have been set up, but he said it looked really real. You know, it didn't look like, you know, anybody in a suit. So, you know, and I think he didn't for years talk about this. He no. didn't, you know, he didn't make any money out of it. And, and you know, he, he's only talking about it at conferences now because people believe him. He didn't yeah. talk about it for years. He didn't say anything about it. He was, you know, made an appearance in R.C. Clark. But that that was it, really. He didn't really do anything until relatively recently. For years, he didn't really talk about it, you know. So, yeah. Interesting. 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 Um, um, is there any chance you'd ever be... You haven't, do you reckon he'd be interviewed on tape? Do you reckon you could be able to fly over and get an interview with him? He wouldn't fly over. No, he wasn't. Um, no, could you? I mean, know, was, if you flew back, flew would back. I did it. I did interview once. I taped it, and it, it, my tape didn't work, which I was really annoyed about. But and I, I, I got the because it was one of these film um, documentary film cake with actual film, and it didn't work sadly. But um, yeah, I mean, we could try. Yeah, I mean, he's not that. You know, he's quite an elderly chap now. Um, but yeah, he might do. I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've been with him when people have filmed him. So, yeah, he might, he might do one for. I could ask. Well, if you go back, go back, Tom rather could set it up. Yeah. Right. Okay. There's a really annoying echo on my. Um, I'm just going to try and move to another microphone. Hang on. Yeah, I mean, I've got a dinner invite, so I could always in interview him when I'm at his house. <laughs> Where did you see a big? Did you talk about that? That was literally two and a half miles from Patty's site near Bluff Creek. It was, um, it's on a road going out of a village towards Orleans um, in Northern California, which is right by Bluff Creek. I actually did go to the end of Bluff Creek and stood near the sign. Um, but Patty's bit, you know, it's very, we were, we were thinking of going down there, but the rangers said don't because of loads of marijuana growing down there and people have been shot you know in that area it's quite a dangerous area i mean a couple of years before we were there there was a serial killer going along this female who would come up to people and um um and say you know do i look good or i can't remember a thing but basically he said the wrong answer she slit your throat so I mean, it was, so it's quite a, you have to watch yourself around there there's a sort of she she was put in prison um luckily but there was there was we were told to be careful where we walked um we had to, you know, the ranger told us areas that were okay and areas that weren't. So it is quite a dodgy area. But we were li literally, yeah, we were literally two and a half miles. Um, and you, you don't, we only saw one logging truck. We had some people data join us, um, but it was there for about, I think, seven, eight days. And um, we saw one logging truck go past us. Um, uh, no, sorry, one um, that big van thing, not logging truck. Um, and then we had a couple of other families join us at a campsite, but it was so remote, there was just nobody around there. But we did have those Bigfoot footprints, um, loads of them around the campsite. Um, and also there was a couple of mole hills and you could see the footprints quite clearly. And one of our people got out of a tent, um, started, she camped purposely away, started screaming it's in front of me, it's in front of me. We all tried to get out of our tent really fast. And Tom got out of the tent a lot faster than the rest of us. Um, 
and he said I could hear him saying you're a big lad aren't you and something heavy was moving away I could still hear Kathy screaming and supposedly she got out of a tent and walked into this thing and it had seemed to have used infrasound so we and she said it was making this like humming noise and then her legs were just not working they they'd gone stiff as boards and I don't think it was fright because she's you know stupidly not scared of them to the point of stupidity because you know in theory they they could eat you they are omnivores and she just couldn't she was literally like a board when we got to her the legs were just stiff it was very very bizarre and we had to sort of hold her up for a while so that that was quite bizarre so but supposedly she literally you know walked into the chest of us <laughs> And Tom saw it, so that was quite bizarre. Where he saw something very, very large, but he could hear something bipeded walking away that was very, very large. So, like, a, or a very, very big person, but it was quite bizarre. But, um, but I didn't see it. I was too. I was my sleeping bag zip and stuck, and I was desperately trying to get out. <laughs> but Tom saw it, and she saw it. But yeah, supposedly that was a bigfoot. So, yeah. Come on, come on. Yeah. Oh, 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 he's going. Oh, he's going. Yeah. Right, okay, right, next. Okay, next. Um, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have one because the cat keeps climbing up my chest, but I think we're going to have to get Jackie to come and do a full talk on her Bigfoot experience because yeah, that's, yeah. that's, Jackie, would you be up for that? Yeah, I'm fine to do that, yeah. yeah no problem. Didn't you say you recorded, you made recordings as well while you were out there of strange noises in the night? Um, I've got, Interviews, yeah, the, the, the I did, did do recording, they were so distant, it wasn't coming out, but we did, um, yeah, we did sort of that. That was more the previous time, actually. We got some whoops and howls, we did get some whoops on this site, but they were so distant, you couldn't really record them, they're very, very faint, didn't really have the proper recording equipment then, but yeah, Liz Barkley. A deep dive into the Patterson Gilmore film, the six part Astonishing Legends series. So, six parts there. Um, sitting on the fence, the breasts would be hairless. Liz Barkley says it's our local takeaways logo, the Yak and Yeti Grill. Okay. That's the airport in um, Kathmandu, it's called the Yak and Yeti. Really? Yep. Okay. We used to have a Mongolian restaurant in Chelt, but actually, while we're just waiting to see if Christian comes back, Oh, yeah. Hi. While I was actually um, sitting here listening to the talk, I suddenly saw a white figure go across the room Mm -hmm. and it moved across the room from left to right. And I was watching the thing and I saw it out the corner of my eye. So I turned and a few moments later, it did exactly the same thing again. And if you imagine a kind of white, quite significant woman just drifting across. And Mm -hmm. it was only when it did it the third time, I realized it was a seagull. That was just circling outside. <laughs> Look at the second one, and it just glided past with its wings <laughs> like that sideways. But because I was so intent on Bigfoot, I caught it out. Of the... Anyway, so it turned out I wasn't seeing the appar- an apparition; I was just seeing a, a seagull. Right. Well, next time I see a significant woman sort of drive, drifting past me, um, I'll make sure it's not a seagull. I'll let you know. Right it's not a seagull. <laughs> question, you had a question, and my sound is playing up. Are you all right to take over the questions from this point? Yeah, I can do that if you like. Yeah, I can, I can see, obviously, what's happening with the sound. So, yeah, Stu, I mean, I was, I was the rest of your talk, I was trying to find a source reference. I'll put it in the uh, in the comments there. Of, so the mountain range that's relatively nearby actually is a megalithic structure, and mm-hmm. it. And I was trying to find the book where I read this. Um, so to my understanding, part of the film crew were actually going to that location, um, of the wider team at the camp. And uh, what this megalithic site actually is is it's eroded um, a number of megalithic uh, animals, so creatures that used to exist in the US. Mm. Of course, they're carved into the rocks and the stones, but they are now eroded to the point where you can only barely notice they look like an animal. And uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, a great um, appreciation for those that particular site. And could I find what that site is called? For the entire time I've been listening to this talk, can't find it. <laughs> ah, oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, I was that. That probably was what they were going to. And I, I read that reference. Going, I've got to find that up because I bet he doesn't know that. <laughs> But no, I couldn't find it. I, I will get it back over to you when I do find that. So as I've brought down more of these questions here, 
Uh, I guess there's Jackie Tonks there talking about that. And I see uh, Liz Barkley has put a comment in there regarding the deep dive for the Patterson Gimlin film, part six of the Astonishing Legend, sorry, Astonishing Legend series. I'll put my uh, teeth back in, as they say. Mm-hmm. Uh, so lots of uh, appreciation for your talk tonight. And uh, Tony Hayes says, I think you can rule out uh, fraud acting independently. The risk associated with witnesses carrying firearms and getting the bullet through the head is just too high. Uh, they would have had to been acting together. Great talk. Not normally something I'm interested in. Uh, you kept me watching. Thank you. Uh, so we have here, uh, I'd love to know where the original film is. Do, do you know where that film is now stored and kept to? The original, no idea, to be honest. They've been, they're, they're, um, the original, so say, was auctioned on eBay about 20 years ago when eBay started going. Um, but uh, apparently it was a second generation print. Where the original went, I have absolutely no idea. Because it'd be worth a bloody fortune now, get, wherever um, it was. sold to uh, uh, Rennie Del Hinden. Because he was, was getting was really um, uh, jealous and and to the point of pathology um, with the others, and in the end they just thought, oh, just sick. And he was really pressurising to buy the film, so they sold it to him. So his widow, the last time we know, his widow had it, but I don't know whether she's in still alive. It seems to, we don't know whether she's still got it, but that's what I was told. Yeah. That is something to follow. Up. Something to follow up. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so Davey Watt asks the question: Do you believe in Bigfoot? And if you do, would you see him as a flesh and blood creature or something else? Yes, no, and possibly in yes. Next question. <laughs> yeah. No. I yes, I do believe in Bigfoot. I believe certainly enough things are seen. I think it's a combination of things. As I think an awful lot of fortune things are, I think there's a combination of stuff which we tend to perceive in quite a narrow way. So, yes, I do believe there are flesh and blood big feet. There certainly are in other parts of the world. I think the Armist is probably a form of Bigfoot, Yeti, Yowie, um, the, the South American ones, the cat tires, all that kind of stuff. They are all pretty much the same kind of animal, I think. Um, but I also believe that there's a spiritual kind, which a lot of the um, the, the Indian tribes, the First Nation tribes, rather, always said there were two types. There's one which is the spiritual animal and one which is the flesh and blood animal, which they often regard as a kind of man. They regard it as another tribe, effectively. So, yes, I believe, yeah, I believe that, that, that it all exists um, and they are just perceived in quite a similar way a lot of the time. So there's a lot of crossover. So, yeah, I do believe in them. OK, so Ruth Morris says, I really do hope that you are Bigfoot <laughs> in disguise. Uh, there are a lot of similar sightings in the UK and remote areas of Scotland. Is that actually true? No. Next one. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I wrote a big thing about this in uh, the 14 times, actually, a couple of years ago, the British Bigfoot. I think it's, um, um, I think, well, th- th- there's certainly big black shapes are seen quite a lot of the time, but I think they are, it's currently a cultural thing to refer to them as big feet, because anything that's big, black, with a pointy head, is perceived now as a Bigfoot, because that's what... The culture is absolutely sort of saturated with whereas 100 well 200 years ago that would have been a black monk you know and 500 years ago it would have been a black monk and a thousand years ago it'd be a genius cucolati you know it's it, they're, they're called different things i think it's more a case of labeling rather than, than an actual specific thing if that makes sense so i think it's something else altogether it's just at the moment they're being identified as big feet because they they fit the general parameters that's basically it that's yeah. my idea I understand that in the 1970s there was the, I think it was perhaps as your article actually written for TN Times mm-hmm. about the the gorilla that was along the canal side in in Manchester in the late yeah. 1970s. I think it was one of your articles, and I can remember what happened a couple of years ago with the Canning Chase, yeah, case where it actually I, if you go to Haley Stevens' website, I, I posted a, uh, an article on there yeah. uh, in regards to a a there was a student film being made of a man dressed in a Bigfoot. And he commented it actually to a post of mine, and we had back and forth conversation. I, I've put that verbatim on uh, on her website, Haley is a Ghost, um, of the guy talking about he was dressed up for a student film. But because of that, a local paranormal investigator saw that man and thought he was walking through the woods. And now the story is that there's a Bigfoot walking around Canic Chase. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been, um, Canic Chase has got kind of a, it's kind of a weirdness area. It's like Bolam Lake and all that kind of stuff. They do seem to attract. Or they do seem to generate that kind of sighting. And it's kind of, it's it's interesting. There's obviously something going on. There's one called Lee Woods in Bristol, just the other side of the Avon Gorge from uh, from Clifton. 
And um, there, there, there's been for, for, for many, many years, there's been what's been described variously over the years as a caveman or as a gorilla or things like that scene. And it's, um, yeah, you know, it's it, it, people are seeing something. This, this is the point I always take with 14 stuff. People are clearly mm -hmm. seeing something. It's just what they're seeing, you know, and uh, so much of it is culturally influenced. And at the moment, the big thing is Bigfoot. So people think, oh, I'm seeing a Bigfoot, you know, 50 years ago, it would have been something else. Yeah. So Daryl Hudson makes a comment on here that it, I guess includes a question. It says, not long after Patty in the early 1970s, the Sasquatch Sierra sounds uh, were recorded by... Uh, Ron Moorhead. That's right, and Alberry. But So both Susan Trackers of the time and the same kind of general area. I mean, uh, that audio apparently is available to listen to on YouTube. It, if is. Guys, who are it is, and it's the most... If you've never heard the Sierra sounds, they are the most eerie thing you've heard. They're amazing. They um, it's, It contains a mixture of howls, but they're the howls that have been um, analysed by the University of Ohio, I think it was, and that basically whatever's generating them has a much bigger vocal trap than a human being. They're not being mucked around with. They've not been manipulated in any way. They are absolutely genuine mammalian howls, but there is something with, the, with, with basically an anthropoid voice box, but much bigger than a human voice box. And those howls are generally... And the other thing is what's called samurai chatter, um, which you've never heard samurai chatter really does freak you out. And it's apparently them talking to one another. And it's... Um, yes, imagine if you were in a hut at the top of a mountain... And what you can hear outside are very big things, basically sounding like the Seven Samurai. The way they say it, it's very sort like that. But it's just, ooh. <laughs> you know, it's not kids playing about. You're 50 miles from anywhere else and you're armed. It's not kids. It's a whole shit. You know, yeah. Yeah, no, they're worth seeking out, Sierra Sounds. So uh, Liz Barclay makes the comment, I guess that it does pop up quite often now, is do you believe that Bigfoot is interdimensional? I don't know. As I said earlier on, I think there's all different types of it. And I think there are the flesh and blood ones. Um, I think there are the spiritual ones, whether they're interdimensional or whether that's just the spiritual ones. Again, I don't know. I think interdimensional. The, the problem is, I think once quantum started coming out, a lot of people saw it as convenient thing to ascribe a lot of paranormal stuff. You know, oh, if we make it quantum, we can kind of like explain it. Well, you can't. The problem is, I think, was it Niels Bohr said, there's only three people in the world who understand um, quantum theory. I'm one of them and I don't understand it. So it's kind of like that's basically it. It's it's very, very tempting to go, well, quantum. Th no, quantum theory doesn't necessarily say what you think it says. And it's, you know, I think it's I, it might have a place. I don't know. I don't know. I, I never wore it. I never, ever rule anything out being a Fortean. However, I think so. There's times you think, no, I think you're just stretching now to try and find stuff so i think it's it's a trendy idea it might be true but i don't know i don't think it is though i don't know with the stretching and the uh the crossover with other topics i guess darren hudson makes the comment also here that there apparently is a, a crossover between bigfoots and uap encounters simultaneously across the us so i don't know if that's actually the case but i have heard that mentioned mm, i've heard it a few times yeah it happened a lot in the 60s there was kind of especially in the midwest there was a lot of weirdness and weird looking bigfoots um that that seemed to happen quite a lot but again, it was the same time as the Outer Limits and Twilight Zone was on quite regularly on TV. So it's kind of like it's got that kind of side to it, you know. That is a mention here by Tony Percy. He talks about the, the Lava Beds National Monument. Um, while further east, the Lava Beds National Monument has a vast collection of petroglyphs carved by the Modoc people. Um, mm. I do believe they do depict characters that are Bigfoot like in some of those pictures. They do. It's um. This this is this is something that's been pointed out by a lot of people, especially with the um, Ojibwe and people like that, um, and on the west coast, especially in British Columbia, a lot of the totem poles will contain ten, fifteen animals, all of which are known animals. There's eagles, there's orcas, there's there's boar, there's bears, there's wolves, and in the middle there's a Sasquatch, and all the rest of them are known living animals. And they'll sort of say, well, why have you got an Oh, yeah, and, and there's this weird belief that, well, I don't know, well, fine, they've got 14 known animals there and one they've made up. It's like, why would they do that? <laughs> you know, it's kind of an odd thing. Yes, and the petroglyphs do appear to show big, big, but well, basically big humans, aren't they? They're not yeah. bears, they're big humans. And it's, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. So there's a, a documentary on Amazon about Bigfoot. I'm sure there's been plenty, actually, mm. on the area, but it asserts that they, again, are interdimensional. Um, again, I, that's it get, they get that crossover with lots of different other types of phenomena isn't it so it's it's been, it is very much a, a sort of an in theory um i'm I just said i'm not completely discounting it might be true but i think it's 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 been picked up by an awful lot of people 
because it sounds good because you can explain a lot with quantum. But can you actually explain a lot with quantum? That's the problem, isn't it? It's it's quite a trite thing to say. I don't know though. It might be. I don't know, you know, I'm not. You know, we deal with the unknown. You can't really uh, uh, rule anything out because it's unknown to start with. It's you know, of course. So I can remember in. Um... I, th I think actually it was Richard Freeman who directed me towards um, regarding like trolls across like um, across Europe. You know, mm. there were like, king lists where they would go out and kill seven boars, you know, four deer and two trolls. And yeah. it's like where they effectively where they used to be under a bridge. They used to have a nest under their feet, very gorilla, very uh, animalistic like. And of course, they mm. were apparently quite intelligent. They moved, they threw rocks. And I think were they also, did they fit the characteristics of what Bigfoot were hunted to the point of extinction? <laughs> Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, it's a, I was, um, as I said in the British Bigfoot article, that it's mentioned in Gawain and the Green Knight, you know, and he, he basically, there's the, the, the wood was the ones and the narrows, which basically means there was one around where the Wirral is now. There was, uh, there was a troll or a wild man or a wild beast, man beast, which killed people. And the, and the Green Knight, you know, Gawain kills it. So it's kind of, you know, th these things go all the way through. There's always been the legends, you know. I'm not, again, but I talk about British Bigfoot, I'm not saying there weren't. 500 years ago, there might well have been. I think now it's far too, yeah, you know. But then black cats, there are black, and we know black cats are bloody there. So, you know, again, don't discount it. It's possible, I suppose. You know? Yeah. Okay, that's, that brings all of our questions for this evening uh, to a close. I know CJ's been having a, a strange issue with his mic. Uh, CJ, would you like to bring us up for the to whoever's talking next week, if you are there? CJ's not there. <laughs> No, I'm here. I'm just wondering, Claire actually will be able to tell us who's on next. Claire, are you still here? I do. I... Claire, are you with us? Okay, I will look up who it is. Give me a second. I hope everyone's having a good week. So, uh, I don't think we can afford, unfortunately, to fly anyone to Black Creek just at the moment, else I would mm -hmm. definitely be doing up for that. Not personally. Um, probably oh, I'd buy the bullet for that one, mate. I really would. You would love to go there, yeah? Well, I would or love to go there. Maybe we can make some arrangements, but I don't think it's cheap to get to the US, unfortunately, is it? It's so, not, no. That's the problem, especially the West Coast. It's a yeah. cheap space. But maybe we'll do a skunk ape instead. Just go to Orlando. That'd be fine. <laughs> not cheaper. <laughs> Just end up in Disneyland. Um, well, might do, possibly, you know. <laughs> Which is which is the one on the west coast? Disney World is the west coast, isn't it? Disney yeah, Land. Disney World's California. Yeah. Which one? Which one is bigger? Oh no, Disneyland's the west coast, isn't it? Disney World is Orlando, isn't it? I think I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm fifty-seven. I can't I can't remember what I had for breakfast. Let alone which bloody Disney World's where. God. <laughs> oh well, next week is on apo apo apotraic magic. Is that how you say it? Apototraic. Uh, I can't almost say it. Apoto trick magics it's protection magic and it's brian hoggard so he'll be taking us through the history of folk magic strange signs found in buildings and how to ward your uh baby's cot from them pesky trolls <laughs> uh, nice I'm, 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 trolls i mean you know there's something i grew up with nisa and trolls I don't see any why anyone would doubt their existence. They're small, they're rubbery, and they have brightly coloured hair. Have you not seen them yourselves? <laughs> Enough of my silliness for one week. Richard Freeman's coming back in a few months' time as well. He'll be doing another talk. And I'm sure Stu will be back with another fascinating talk very quickly. But thank you very much to Stuart and for Christian for taking over the questions tonight. Thank you to everybody else for attending tonight. 